family and thank you for joining us once again as we conclude this sermon series on how God wants to reset our heart, our mind, our voice, and our hands to his purposes. Now today we're looking at how God wants to reset our hands. And when I think about that, I think of the hands of Jesus Christ, those hands that healed, those hands that reached out with love and concern to the world around him, and ultimately those hands that were nailed to a cross so that our sins would be taken upon him and we would be freed, that we would be set free from our sin and from our death. I think of those Roman soldiers as they took those hammers and they hound, pounded those nails into Jesus' hands. So again, that we could be free, so that we could be free to praise God, to give God glory, and to reach out to the world with love concern and service so just as Jesus reached out his hands on that cross just as he stretched out his arms and allowed his hands to be nailed for the forgiveness of our sins we are to reach out to our community and to our world with his love with his unconditional grace and so I pray that God may open up your minds today I pray that God will refresh your hearts and souls and minds so that you can hear the word that God has intended for you from Pastor Sarah. So I pray for Pastor Sarah that her words might, uh, might touch your hearts and souls and minds. I pray that God will open up your minds so that you can hear his word today. So truly, may, may God bless each and every one of you. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. The amazing thing about being reset by Jesus is that it actually begins to impact what we do. We all spend our time doing something. So what if we devote the action of our lives to God? You see, Jesus wants to reset your hands. Hi, faith family and friends. I'm glad to be here with you today as we finish up our series on reset. We are in week four. So this is the last week. This is it on reset. It has been a great several couple of weeks. We've had lots of great Bible studies, lots of great discussions, and I'm really looking forward to having one last study this week as we close out this whole series of reset. But I hope that you've recognized that there's a bit of a progression over the last several weeks. We started several weeks ago with resetting our hearts. Then we talked about resetting our minds. Last week, Pastor John talked about resetting our voice. And today we're gonna to talk about resetting our hands. You see, the progression is, is intentional because as we reset our faith and we commit to following Christ, we are compelled to read more about him, to read his word. And when we fill ourselves with God's truth by reading scripture, it comes out in the things we say. We, we sound wiser. We sound uh, more loving because we're hearing and reading God's scripture. And what we'll find today is the more we fill ourselves again with God's scripture, as we have reset our faith, reset our minds, reset our voices, is a natural progression then to reset our hands, to do the go and do part of evangelism, of sharing our faith with others, of loving others really excited about where we're going today and I hope that you're here to join us as we start talking about what it looks like to reset our hands. 
Now today we're going to be going into a couple of different Bible verses and our main text is going to come from Galatians chapter 5 and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But right now I want to share with you a story, a story that comes to us from Luke chapter 5 and it is a great example of what reset hands look like. So this is probably a familiar story to you, but let's read it together. It's Luke chapter 5 starting in verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Holy Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, minds, and souls together be pleasing unto your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, if you're anything like me, when I hear familiar Bible stories, sometimes I check out. Sometimes I don't necessarily think all the way through or I, I kind of start to daydream a little bit because I know the story, right? And this is one of those stories that I've heard over and over again but it's no less remarkable than it was the first time that I heard it. You see, we just have to think about the details a little bit better. Maybe retell the story in a way that emphasizes what it is that we're talking about today. You see, today we're talking about resetting our hands. So what does it look like these four friends? They have reset hands. So let's look at the story again, maybe from their perspective. You see, their friend is paralyzed. He can do nothing on his own. But these friends will not be deterred. They are loyal to a fault. They love their friend. And they know that they just need to get him to Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus has been teaching and preaching. And he has this different message. A message that people are curious about. They want to hear this man named Jesus. He's been performing signs and wonders. People want to see what it is he's going to do. And so he's been drawing such large crowds. And on this day, as those friends try to bring their friend to Jesus, they can't get in the house. There are too many people coming to see Jesus that day. But they're not going to be deterred. They have determination. They have reset hands. And they're going to do something for their friend. So not to be deterred, they jump up on the roof and they start digging. It makes me wonder what the people inside must have been thinking, what Jesus must have been thinking. Of course, we hear from the scripture that Jesus can read minds, so I guess maybe he probably already knew what was coming. But the people on the inside of the house had to be curious about what was on top of the roof and what was coming through the roof. And probably right about the time that they were about to send somebody out to see what was happening, there's a hole come through the roof. And I can see Jesus looking up into this hole as dust is raining down, probably looking at these friends with a twinkle in his eye. He knows what's about to happen. And these friends see this opening and they take it as an opportunity. They lower their friend down right at the feet of Jesus. They were going to do whatever it took to get their friend straight in front of Jesus. And Jesus, probably with a wink, up at the friends, looks down, forgives the sins of this paralyzed man, and heals him. They go off, walking away, praising God. It really is an incredible story about what it looks like to have determination to bring people right to Jesus, right at the feet of Jesus. 
It is a great story and one that I always enjoy hearing and listening to and sharing with others. But you know, this isn't the only time that people have brought others to Jesus. This isn't the last time that people have stepped up and stepped out in faith. I can think of tons of examples just sitting here in my office this morning. You know, just a couple weeks ago, I shared a, an incredible story with my students in youth group about a, a man who was experiencing homelessness. He had nothing, not even forms of ID, no birth certificate, no, no driver's license, nothing. And without those things, you really can't do much. And in his story, it was a group, a community of people surrounded him helped him to get that documentation, even though it took six to eight months to get all of that documentation. Walked with him, helped meet his needs. There was even a man who walked around with a sign on his chest that said, hire Mark on it, and walked with him from job interview to job interview. It's an incredible story as this man experienced true relationship with others and with Christ. I think of stories even in our own church about the courage it took to go to places like Haiti and Guatemala, our students to Belize, to work with the faith communities there, to reach out, to do evangelism, to bring other people to Christ. You know, I think about even the ministries that are started here in our own church. I think about Glenna and her bags to mats, this, this cause that she has championed to help the homeless of our community. You see, this is not the only time or the only place, the story in scripture, where people have stepped up and stepped out for Christ. And I think we would do well to remember that the only thing that's gonna change this world for the better is Jesus Christ. There is no solution that can address the hurt and the pain and the troubles of this world like Christ, like Jesus. And these four friends, or however many friends there were, they knew that. The only one who could help their friend was Jesus. And for us in this world, right now in our time and in our place, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. And so it's time for us to reset our hands. Because these moments, these examples of having reset hands, of this holy determination to be Jesus' hands, you know, it, it just fills my heart every time. Every example. It makes us, makes our hearts warm. It makes us want to be a part of something bigger because truthfully, in the end, we were created to be in partnership with God. God has invited us. He's called us to be his agents in this world, to go and to do, to go and do the great commission, to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. So we're called to have reset hands. So now that our faith now that our minds and now that our, our voices are reset to Christ, perhaps it's time to reset those hands. But surely this brings about some questions, right? We think about, okay, we've got the mind stuff down, we've got the heart stuff down, we've got the voice stuff down, but why are we helping other people again, right? Maybe that's, that's the question that comes up for you, or maybe the question that comes up for you is, who am I supposed to love? Or maybe the question that comes up for you is, how am I supposed to show love to others? Now, these are all good questions when it comes to this idea of resetting our hands, of being people who go and do, people of action, our faith in action. So we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5 today. And just as I turn there, I want to just share a little bit. You see, Paul is writing to the church at Galatia, and he spends a little time in Galatians talking about his conversion his faith story. And he shares that he didn't come to know Christ through his actions, but he came to know Christ through his faith. That's how his relationship started. But now to live out his faith, he uses actions. And that's what we're called to do. And so Galatians chapter five, he tells us exactly what it is we're supposed to do. And he helps us answer these questions of why are we helping other people again? <laughs> Who are we supposed to help? And he answers the question, of how we're supposed to, to love others. So let's answer these questions together today by looking at Galatians chapter five. Now we're gonna start with verse 13, but really all of Galatians isn't that long and I highly recommend just taking some time to read through the book of Galatians. It is a really good story. So let's look at this, uh, this scripture today by looking at Galatians chapter five, starting in verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free 
but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping with this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So the question, the first question we're trying to answer today is, if we have reset hands, like why are we resetting our hands again? Like why are we supposed to, to love others? What is our call here? And Paul is trying to tell us that we have this freedom. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You see, we were set free. When we reset our hearts, we called Christ. We accepted Christ to be our Lord and our Savior. And we were freed from the power of sin and death. No longer can sin hold us captive. No longer can death hold us captive. We are set free, transformed by God's grace. So we are now free. We are called to be free. But he says we can't use our freedom for ourselves, for self-indulgence. No, we are called to set others free with our freedom. So now that we have this good news of Jesus Christ, that it's transformed us, now we need to go and show that same freedom, that, that same transformation to others. So that's what we're called to do. That's why we're called to have reset hands, to go and do the work, to help others see there is freedom out there for them. So he says this, don't use your freedom as an excuse for self-indulgence, but serve one another humbly in love, right? It sounds good. Sounds like a, a good idea. That's what we're called to do. That's what we should do. But maybe it's not quite so simple. You see, Paul goes on, and I can't say that I love these next verses because they, they remind me that I have some more work to do. But let's move on just a little bit and read a little bit further. We're going to skip down to verse 16. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, and drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now you may be wondering, so what does that have to do with having reset hands? Well, that's a really good question. If we're called to love others, if we're called to love God, love others, have these reset hands, then we have to live like it. We have to live like we're living by the Spirit. And that's kind of the go and do portion of what we're talking about today, of having reset hands. If we are to love others, if we're called to have freedom, we use that freedom for others. Not to go on sitting because we know we'll be forgiven. But as I read this, you know, I look through the list and I think, yeah, okay, I'm doing pretty good. Maybe the, the, I'm pretty good on the witchcraft section. Hatred, maybe only if somebody cuts me off in traffic, right? Same with, uh, you know, jealousy or fits of rage. I'm, I'm doing okay on those things. But it's the selfish ambition one that hits me in the gut every single time. It's like a gut punch, right? Because when you think about it, I, I think about using my hands for God, about going and serving more often or, or really doing more evangelism or those sorts of things. And I start to think, you know what, that sounds really great. I want to do those things, but you know what, I just don't have time right now, so I'll wait and do it later. Or maybe I'll wait till my semester's over or as soon as, uh, as, soon as I'm done with the kids being in school or swim season, we'll get on that. But I have to be honest, these are all just excuses. We have hundreds of them. I have hundreds of excuses. Because really under this heading of selfish ambition is things like convenience. It's not always convenient to carve out time in our schedules or in our days or in our weeks to help others. It's not always comfortable to step up and step out for other people. And sometimes we worry about the cost. What is it going to cost us to help? If I give to this cause or to that cause, am I going to have the money to take the trip I've been wanting to take or to make those big purchases I've been waiting and saving for? You see, these, like I said, are just excuses. And they all fall under that heading of self-ambition that for me is the one that I fall into the most, where I elevate myself above others. And I don't think I'm alone in that. You know, it really is selfish ambition and it hurts and it's not helpful. So 
Why are we called to serve others? Why are we doing this? Because truthfully, I have been set free. We have been set free. And God has called us to use that freedom for others, not for ourselves, but for others. Someone did that for you. Someone did that for me. And so it's called, we're called to do that for others. So let's move on now, right? Let's talk about what's next. So if we know why we're doing this, right? Because we've been set free. We want to set others free. Who are we supposed to help now? Now, this is a great question because if you think about it, if you read scripture, the first thing I think about is the Samaritan or the good Samaritan, that parable. You see, back in Luke chapter 10, there's a lawyer that comes to Jesus and asks, who am I supposed to love? Who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus tells the story in very Jesus-like fashion. He tells a parable, this parable of the good Samaritan. And in it, he basically says, anybody who's in need is your neighbor, all people. You see, need dictates neighbor status. All people who are in need are your neighbor. And so the question for us is, who is your neighbor? Who are the people in your community that have needs that you can help? But here's the thing. I, I want to just warn you, not warn you necessarily, but I want to encourage you that not everything is yours to do. You can't single-handedly fix our community. You can't single-handedly help uh, an entire problem like world hunger or, or the water crisis, right? But surely there is a mission field for you. And so one of the things that our study this week in our book, uh, our small groups or Bible studies, it talks about this section, this idea of who are we helping? It also talks about the need to not just go and do, but to sit and wait. You see, each of us have been given gifts and talents and passions, and those are to be funneled into your mission. So we need to sit and wait upon God and ask him, where's our mission field? Who is it we are meant to serve? Who is it I am meant to serve? Because when we sit and we wait with reset hearts, resetting our, our minds by reading and taking in God's word, filling up ourselves with his spirit, with his word, we're going to be ready for the go and do part. So that when Jesus gives us the opportunity, when he clearly shows us where our mission field is, we are ready to go, ready to go and do just as he calls. And so as we try to discern where our mission field is, who we're supposed to serve, ask God, spend time with God, ask him, where's your mission field? Where am I supposed to serve? And then listen and take courage and go forward grasping those opportunities. As someone uh, said to me earlier this week, to go and have a, a holy boldness for our mission. So third, here's the third question and probably one we all ask at one point or another, how are we supposed to love? Well, Paul tells us here in Galatians chapter five, in verse 14, he says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping with this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's exactly what it means, that we're supposed to love others the way we love ourselves. And I think that sometimes this gets a little confusing because sometimes we aren't always the nicest people to ourselves. We're often our, our, uh, our worst critics, right? But I think what this means for us is that it means we need to think about others the same way we think of ourselves. And if we are in trouble or if we find ourselves up against a wall, we're going to work to get out of it, right? When we find that our livelihood is threatened, we're going to perk up and stand up to try and make things right. When we find that our safety is threatened, we're going to react. We're going to stand up. When we find that, that maybe our, our voice has been silenced, we're going to work hard to make sure our voices are heard. When we see that our rights are threatened, we speak up. When we see that our families are threatened, we take notice and we rise up. And that's exactly what we're called to do for others. To go and do means to stand up, to advocate, to stand with others, to go and love them the way that we love ourselves. What Paul is saying here is that we need to do the same thing for others. We need to love well. We need to serve well. Let God's spirit flow through us as we serve and love others. 
You see, if we move on just a little bit here, if we, if we read a little bit further in Galatians chapter 5, we hear another familiar Bible verse. It's this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and selfish ambition. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep up in step with the Spirit. You see, the more that we love others, the more that we have a, a reset faith, when we take that challenge seriously every day, we reset our faith, we reset our, our minds by taking in God's Word. We fill ourselves with God's Word so that it comes out in our voice and in our actions. We can start to see a great harvest. When we love others through God's spirit, as he calls us to, to into the mission field and we reach out and respond, we react, we grab onto those opportunities and love others. What we're going to get is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if I'm honest, I think that's what we need more of in the world right now. Why? Why do we need to love others? Because we're free. And we want to share that freedom with other people. And who do we serve? We serve those God calls us to. We take those opportunities when they present themselves with a holy boldness. And how do we love? The way we love ourselves. The way that we stand up and fight for ourselves. That's how we love others. You see, having reset hands it's not an easy thing to do, but it is this natural progression and it is easier to do when we have reset hearts, reset minds, reset voices. It's so much easier to reset our hands. So this is where we are. This is the end of our reset. Everything all reset, right? But here's the deal. At the end of these four weeks, you have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. You see, we can let this be another sermon series that, that we think is great. Maybe we've, we've learned some things, we've been challenged, we've been encouraged, we're ready to, to, to go and, and to do, but maybe we slip back into our habits. We fall back into the everyday sort of lifestyle and we forget about picking up the Bible and reading it. We forget about our daily devotions or we forget about constant prayer. We forget to ask God about our mission field or we might ignore a prompting we feel or hear about talking with someone or sharing with someone. Or you can take this invitation to reset your life seriously. You can really seriously think about what it would look like to have reset faith, to really spend time in God's word so that it affects your voice, that it shows up in the work of your hands. This is not an easy decision. It's one that takes time and it takes effort. It takes sacrifice. But friends, what we need more than anything else in this world is Jesus. And we are his agents. We are called to be his agents of peace and love in this world as we work to fight for his kingdom coming to this earth. And so, are you ready to say yes? Are you ready for a reset life? And if so, it's time to, to take it, to come back and ask God, I am ready for a reset. Are you ready to say yes? Let us pray. Holy Father, we have been so many places over the last few weeks. And Lord, this is such an important step in our lives and in our faith. God, we ask that you speak so clearly to us today. That you help us to hear your words you help us to understand that, that we love others because we are set free. You have set us free, and we want to share that with others. Help us to spend time earnestly in prayer, hearing your voice, listening for where you're calling us to serve and to love others. And God, help us to stand. Help us to stand with other people, to love them the way that we love ourselves, the way that you love them, God. Lord, help us to be people of the reset that our church, our community, we might be people of the reset, 
that they might say about faith that we have seen something remarkable here today, just like they said in Luke chapter 5. Lord, we call upon you to just prompt our hearts, draw us nearer and closer to you, that we might hear clearly your voice. Lord, we thank you for all you're doing in the midst of Faith Church, in the midst of the world. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in Reset as we finish out the sermon series today. I'm so excited about what I've seen and the conversations that I've heard, and I hope that you all are well. If you want to continue this conversation or if you have questions about the Reset or questions about Faith Church, please feel free to give us a call here at Faith. I'd be happy to talk with you, and I know Pastor John would do the same. Thank you so much. Have an absolutely wonderful day. God bless. Thank you.